Welcome to AEC Stories. This is former SM3 Dempsey of the USS Mount Hood, or the former USS Mount Hood. Today I've got a very interesting guest, Jose B. Gonzalez, who's a former retired command master chief from the Navy, and he was on a variety of very exciting ships. We know some people in common, even though we served at different times, so this is going to be great. How are you doing today, Jose? Lynn, I'm doing fine. So... I mean, you're the first command master chief. I don't even know if I spoke to one while I was in the Navy. <laughs> I don't think we had much more than a senior chief on my ship. Oh, is that um, right? Yeah. Yeah. H- how long did it take to become a command master chief? Uh, well, my first uh, 22 years, uh, I was committed to the uh, engine rooms. And then uh, my last five years, five plus years, uh, as a command master chief, I, I served on the uh, Confibron staff as a command master chief. Uh, we had uh, uh, 19 LSTs and three LSDs and about 8,000 men. Wow. And then my second so uh, tour as a command master chief was on the uh, USS Rushmore as the uh, first and commissioning uh, command master chief for the ship. Wow. So you... Did you ever think you were going to get that far when you first started in the Navy, or was that just like a pipe dream? Or uh, well, actually, I don't know, how, how, well, you know, you're right, a pipe dream. Because uh, when I first uh, went in the Navy, of course, I I was like uh, a lot of young uh, snipes, you know, with uh, going to Captain Smash every now and then. Uh, my <laughs> my uh, uh, my thought was, if I ever made it to chief, that was that was kind of my goal. And, uh, right. and at the time, uh, you remember the chiefs used to wear the, the khakis. And, yeah. And I used to say, man, I could hardly wait till I wear khakis. It just, <laughs> just so happened the year that I made chief, they phased the khakis out. Uh, you could have them for one year, but you know, why spend all that money if you're, you're, if you're going to have to give them up? Uh, so well, that makes sense. Yeah, so, uh, I never, I never did get a chance to, oh, I'm talking about the dress khakis. Now, obviously, yeah, I, yeah. obviously the khakis were, were what, what the chiefs wore. Uh, and, uh, but man, I love those dress khakis. I wish I, I wish I could have, <laughs> had, had ever worn them. But, uh, so what, what year did you go in? What year did you join the Navy? Uh, I, I, you know, it, those things, uh, you never forget. So July the 15th, 1964. Wow. And where were, where were you coming from and where were you going to boot camp? Um, I, I fared out of a little town in Colorado, uh, called La Junta, Colorado. And, uh, I went to San Diego boot camp, company 392. Great memory. Yes. <clears throat> so you're, you're landing in California going, Oh my gosh, this is going to be great. The beach boys and surfing and. <laughs> Yeah, well, I remember in boot camp, uh, the song, I'm on the outside looking, uh, looking in, but it was on the inside looking out. <laughs> I used to say, I used to hate that song. <laughs> did you, did you have a lot of family that was in the military too? Well, uh, my, uh, my dad was World War II, uh, uh, combat engineer and he landed at the, uh, uh, Utah beach. And there's a big ado about the Omaha beach. Nothing really is said about Utah Beach, and uh, and of course those folks, uh, the uh, they followed the uh, the path of the uh, Omaha uh, uh, warriors, mm-hmm. and and my dad was a combat engineer, so he was building the bridges as the Germans were blowing them up. Oh wow! And uh, and, uh, I, and I have uh, uh, I think six pages uh, that that I I. I found were where he actually wrote we landed uh at utah beachhead he he wrote in a little you know those little uh uh back in the old days we had those little uh telephone memory books that we would write telephones oh those little green those little those little green books those little uh yeah brown brown books yeah and uh and he wrote uh on several places where they they uh they were at they were getting snipered uh guys stepping on mines and uh he even wrote on there that uh, he, I think we're the first ones to cross the Rhine River. So, uh, and you know, at that time there there wasn't the comms that 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 the military has. So probably mm-hmm. other other soldiers had crossed 
the Rhine River, you know, and and he didn't know that, you know. So, uh, in his it, that's that's interesting because I took a ferry boat on the Rhine River when I was a kid. My parents were stationed in Germany. Yeah. Well, well, my we're brother all... who who followed me into the navy, uh, he was the second brother to follow me in the navy. Uh, he just went to uh, Normandy uh, last year uh, to to walk the the beaches of Normandy. Oh wow, that's yeah. pretty interesting. Man, so I wish you, I could have I done that. You've been all over the world too, though. I'm assuming. Yes. I mean, uh-huh. we, we do get to travel. <laughs> we do. Uh, you, was, you could be. Go ahead. I was one of those sailors that they say uh, join the navy and see the world, and I, I actually did. Well, you, you know, I saw you, this is how we came to do the podcast. I saw that you had experience on one of those like Pegasus, if I'm right, those hydrofoil type special boats that, you know, the hyper speed boats that the Navy was working on, the kind of experimental craft, right? Right. And, uh, basically the, uh, the Pegasus class, uh, came, came after we did, uh, they started building, uh, the ship that I was on in, uh, 1965. And uh, it was a class of its own because it was the world's largest, world's fastest hydrofoil. For the Pegasus class, I think, was like 120 feet long. We were uh, 200, uh, uh, 200 feet long. Uh, so we That were, thing was like a monster. I don't know if I was looking at your ship, but they were doing like uh, helo ops off that thing at 70 knots. <laughs> oh, <laughs> was no, I looking at the right picture? Um, that picture... They were doing the uh, the official photograph of the ship flying, and uh, wow. and probably the, uh, uh, maybe the uh, anyway I got chewed out for that on that ship because <laughs> because you know the f- official photographs you're supposed to have uh, all the hatches shut. Well, my watch station was uh, um, in the uh, what they we call the exhaust room, and uh, we had g- uh, gas turbine engines as a uh, as a uh, power for the ship. And, uh, and, uh, a lot of, uh, um, exhaust gases used to leak out of the, some of the, uh, joints of the, of the, of the shroud, uh, exhaust shroud. So, mm-hmm. uh, uh, at the time we never knew, but, you know, I was, uh, I used to get some headaches and later on learned that I actually was getting, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. So you were just sitting in a garage with a with a hose and a station wagon, basically. <laughs> basically, that's who it was. So I, I, I was. But unbeknownst, there was no station wagon, I guess. Right, and, and yeah, no, this this thing was a Cadillac, and uh, so I I would go out to the uh, at my my sound power phone would lead me out to the uh, to the fan tail there. So I, I used to open up that hatch and get fresh air. Well, it just so happened they were taking the pictures and. Uh, uh, I happened to be there, uh, not waving. I was just looking out. And, uh, of course the cap, <laughs> all the hatches are supposed to be secured. And I say, Hey, well, captain, you come down here, you smell all that smoke and, uh, and take all that noise, you know, and that would, that would kind of, you know, uh, 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 shut him up if I want to say without being disrespectful. <laughs> 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 we were supposed to, yeah. I mean, back in you, you were in before me, well before me, I was born. Four years after you wow. joined, so you know, I just I just turned fifty the other uh-huh. day, right? Well, congratulations so I'm on that going, milestone. Um, <laughs> thank you. It was funny because I'm I'm looking, I'm going, what's what's this deal over here? You know, what's going on with uh, you know the, those ships? Like back back then in your your era, men had to be tough and rub gunpowder on it. Like, yeah, shut up, rub some gunpowder <laughs> on it, yeah. be a man. Yeah, we should. Do. Right? The, the, the safety standards are like safety standards. None. <laughs> they, they were called none. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and and actually, but we didn't know better. No, no, the society. no. And uh, actually, the um, a lot a lot of that didn't come in to play the safety standards uh, for uh, engineers and even gunners' mates that were were firing uh, in five inch thirty eights. Uh, uh, what happened mm-hmm. was uh, uh, OSHA came aboard to do kind of some survey and. And when they came down in the engine rooms and we're down there at 120, 130 dB with no hearing protection on. And, uh, they said, say, hey, what, what are you doing to these sailors? Well, the, uh, the, uh, the engineer's, uh, frame of mind was that you had to stand your watches uh, with all five senses. And, and obviously hearing was one of them. Uh, and believe me, uh, we couldn't hear nothing, <laughs> but, but, 
you talk about a, t- a tinnitus yeah. machine. Go in there, get some tinnitus on you. Exactly. Go ahead. Uh, ring, ring. <laughs> so, uh, ring. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually have uh, the right side of my face is numb, and uh, I think it's nerve damage from all the all the noise. Because uh, when I used to come out of the engine room, it was like, you know, uh, your face was numb, your teeth felt like they were glazed, and it was it was it was tremendous noise. Wow, it was like a torture chamber of sorts. It, it really is. But I, I did, you know, it's interesting because you talk about the safety standards today. They probably there's studies on everything. Everything's accessible by the internet. But we're like, oh wait, maybe you could die from asphyxiation, or maybe you know, I see guys painting with that green primer. Remember that oh, stuff yeah. that would just make you hallucinate. Oh, yeah. You know <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hallucinogenic green primer right. if you were trapped in some kind of space yeah. you know you or, know just locked in hatched down or, or, or the <laughs> terracotta red which was just as bad boy that thing would give you a high something something fierce uh i used to get punished so i used to get punished uh when i was on the uss jason uh by having to go down in the uh lazarette of a of the boat and and paint, you know mm-hmm. to paint and paint that terracotta uh, with uh you know basically the, uh there was a hatch but but uh in the Philippines with a hundred degree heat the uh the terracotta would would, would uh, you know it would make you dizzy yeah definitely yeah. so was that green paint <laughs> that green that green primer <laughs> I can't think of the name. oh gosh I can't that think green, of the name of that, that green primer was gnarly I remember two guys on the Mestex they weren't wearing their breathing gear the way they were supposed to. One of those little masks with the filters, right? Uh-huh. And uh, probably should have had oxygen looking back. <laughs> <laughs> Not just some kind of filter, right? That's just a typical semi-toxic filter. It wasn't, you know, maybe they should have had an OBA with the canister deployed. But, you know, I look back at that and I remember these guys, they were talking like, I don't know, like they were, you know, beyond Cheech and Chong. They were very stoned off this stuff. And they're just like, hey, I saw an alligator, man. I'm like, what? What is wrong with those guys? Oh, they're in the paint. Oh, because we were walking by them in the passageway. We see these what? two guys well, cracked out on that thing, on the primer. <laughs> well, after that, after that, I bet we wouldn't, we wouldn't pass a piss test. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. you, where, where, let me backtrack. Where did you go from uh, San Diego? Did they send you to A school after boot camp? No, you know what? Uh, being that I told you that I was kind of a bad boy. 10th grade education, uh, I had a score real high to get in the Navy. And of course, uh, I, I don't know this. I found that, found out later on because I actually, uh, done a tour of recruiting duty. But, uh, the, um, uh, my recruiter, uh, had, had asked me a couple of questions, uh, about, uh, you know, how much education I had. And of course, I told him 10th grade and he goes, uh, you probably can't pass the Navy exam. So when I take, took the Navy exam, uh, he was looking at the score key and he is moving it around, you know, flipping around and this and that. And I said, I said, uh, I think if you look at it correctly, I bet, I bet I passed the exam. And he goes, when do you want to go tomorrow? <laughs> and I go, Oh, I passed your Navy test, huh? And, and, uh, so, uh, so, uh, uh, the next day, actually, I, uh, I, uh, Went to Denver, Colorado, took a physical. Uh, I weighed uh, all of 119 pounds when I joined. Oh, my goodness. Bantamweight. Yeah, so I, I, was, <laughs> I was six pounds underweight. And you know how everybody's standing there getting their physical. And and uh, so the, the, the doc gets to me, you know. And so he's looking at a guy that looks like Sad Sack, right? And because uh, I'm, five, I'm five foot ten. Wayne, uh, 119. And, yeah. uh, so then he's, he's, he tells me, uh, start doing duck walks. And everybody had to do a little bit of a duck walk in. So did I at, in the beginning. So then he starts telling me, start doing some duck walks until I tell you to stop, you know? So there I go, duck walking, you know? So, and you just kind of embarrassing because you're, you're, you're stark naked and everybody and you're duck walking, you know? And, and then finally tell me, okay, stop. So then he goes, tells me, uh, you know, do 20 push-ups. I, I, I know it was about 20. And, uh, of course I was real lightweight. So, you know, I, I bang out 20 push-ups. And so, yeah. so then he go, Hmm. He said, uh, all right, get on that, that pull-up bar and do me 10 pull-ups or so. Right. So I get up there and I do 10 pull-ups. I get back in line and he says, 
get, put this guy down for 125 pounds. If I send him out to eat a, a bushel of bananas, he'll never gain six pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, that's that's great if you could do 10 pull-ups. That was Navy SEAL standards, man. Oh, well, That's pretty I could, good. I could do that real easy. You know, I, I was a uh, – uh, I played baseball as, a, as you know, as a Babe Ruth. Uh, I, yeah. actually was, I actually was a uh, Colorado State champ pitcher in 1961. And, oh, wow. Uh, and uh, I lost uh, – my the only game I ever lost uh, playing baseball uh, – would have taken me to the Little League World Series, and I lost that one to nothing in extra innings and pitched a no-hitter. Lost. That's pretty amazing. It seems like you had this drive for success. Were you focused on it, or it was just happening because you just kept driving? <laughs> you know, you know, my, my dad was a, kind of a, a I'm going to say, an instigator of that. Right. Uh, because he was, always, he was always kind of uh, pushing us, you know, and – and, uh, uh, you know, at the time, you know, dad doesn't know nothing. Right. Right. But, right. uh, uh, we're 19 uh, and know and it he, all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and he, uh, well, I was 18 when I joined the Navy. 18 and, and know he, it all. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, it, it was just, it was just, uh, I guess his, my dad had six boys. So, so he had, a a, a leadership about him and the way he used to talk to us and stuff like that. It, it was, uh, uh, now I look at, look at it back and say, gee, gee, dad knew what he was talking about. Maybe he was like a command master chief of a dad type well, guy. Well, I'll tell you what, he was because <laughs> you didn't sash him back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's like, I got to run this. I got to get my military manual to handle these kids. <clears throat> exactly. And you know what? Everything was yes or no, sir, to him too. You know, I wasn't, uh, yeah, okay, you know, wow. uh, yes or no. So, so you were getting primed for doing well, unbeknownst to you, maybe. I don't know. I mean, I, I felt like I kind of was where I grew up. I mean, my school, I was telling you, has produced a lot of uh, some of the biggest leaders in the military right now, just my high school. We only had a graduating class of 48. And like, well, you know, got three generals, an admiral. I mean, it just keeps going from this small group of people, but they were around heavy duty military all the time. So you grow up in it, you become it. You might, you know, if you grow up in the karate studio you'll be a black belt you know pretty much right so same thing sounds like it translated right. for you um what was your yeah our little, our little our little small town of eight thousand people you know we had uh um i think a, a general and of course uh uh um colonels and mm-hmm. commanders you know and, and on down you know for for such a little, little small town, uh, one of my uh, classmate two years ahead of me uh, was the um, uh, uh, part of uh, you know where you, when the Navy band goes to a, uh, a certain occasion and they say okay you take the Navy band because they're spread all over the place. Right. Uh, he he was uh, there uh, at one of the Nixon's functions, right? And he played this piece. And it, and, uh, and, uh, Nixon kind of liked it, right? And when, uh, you know, he said, uh, hey, what was that peace airplane? It was, you remember the song, uh, Here Comes the Clowns? <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, it was just a piece of the plane because it, it was a nice piece. Not so much that, you know, Nixon and his group were a bunch of clowns, you know, <laughs> which they were. <laughs> and, and, and they, he, he actually got fired. They, uh, they, uh, uh, <laughs> that's it, good. Yeah. Uh, true story. And, uh, but, great uh, story. I love it. <laughs> yeah. uh, now that he's a, he's a music, uh, uh, a professor, if I want to say that at, at a junior college there in Colorado, I think. And, uh, well, good for him. Yeah. So that's one of, uh, one of, one of, you know, somebody that I knew very well. You you grew up in a similar environment to me. I mean, I grew up on a military, an army base, colonels, officers, generals, just like you in your small town. Colorado had a lot of military influence in it back in the day. It still does. Yeah, it still does. So, yeah, yeah you, you pick some of that up. And then you go in the military kind of knowing what to expect because you've been around the culture, right? Exactly. And, yeah. and we're, so... From boot camp, was that what you thought it would be? Was it what you, would they push you a little harder, a little less, or? Oh, man, I'll tell you, I had a, 
I had a horrible, horrible experience in boot camp because uh, I was a little bit mouthy. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and you know what? It was, it was, it was mouthy for all the things that were right. And, uh, uh, in other words, when, uh, a company commander would smack a guy down, you know, and I used to ask him, why'd you do that? And he said, how would you like me to hit you? Right. Yeah. And I go, yeah, you're not, you're not going to hit me all of 120 pounds, you know? <laughs> and, and, uh, so I was a guy behind the company, uh, uh, marching and lifting my rifle. I will not sass back. I will not sass back. <laughs> <laughs> so you get some extra PT. Uh, you know, that's good. Yeah. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I got punished a lot, you know, for, for, uh, you know, just, just, uh, I, I, I want to call it my own leadership. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, were you able to pack on any extra weight after, after boot camp? I, I, when I, when I, when I, uh, I grew up, I grew up on beans, tortillas, uh, fried potatoes, uh, uh, mm-hmm. Spanish rice, uh, very small, um, if I want to say variety of, of food, but it was Mexican food. Yeah. I didn't eat no. Didn't eat no bread. Uh, so when I went to boot camp, I actually didn't like a lot of the food. Breakf- breakfast was actually my best meal because I could eat the, uh, the, the, the cereal and milk, right? Right, right. And, uh, and, uh, uh, so when they would make, uh, uh, varieties of food, uh, I just, I just didn't like it, you know, and, and I, I was, uh, man, what am I going to eat? So I, I ate a lot of, uh, bread and butter, you know, uh, and I really don't like bread, but, you know, and, and the guys were look because you you go through the the line and they're slapping everything on there right now the, mm-hmm. now the corn and the peas and stuff like that uh, I, I would eat that but uh, uh, you know like they have corned beef hash yeah to, to this day still don't don't like it you know and and, uh, <laughs> and some of the other, some of the food that I, I I didn't I didn't know what it was I just wouldn't eat it and. Uh, uh, I, I'm not one of these guys. Thirty years later, like I used to run into these older men that were like coming back around the base, you'd run into them at the exchange and they'd been retired. They're at where I'm at or beyond. Right. right. <laughs> I'm a young buck. I'm like in my 19, 20 year old. He's like, Oh, that Navy child, boy, that stuff was good. I'm like, what have you been eating since you got out? <laughs> they were probably the guys that because, were, that were painting. I, the, I'm, not, that, I'm not missing it. Yeah. I'm not missing. <laughs> they were the guys that were painting the red deck around the base. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you, you know, know what? what? I, I said red deck is red, red lead. Yeah. Red lead. You're right. And, uh, the, uh, uh, of course, you know, some of those guys say, uh, they were, Country boys, so they 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 like that stuff. Uh, I remember. Yeah. I remember. They're like this is like they were just happy to all you can eat. It was a buffet every day, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Right. I remember. I got surprised with uh, uh, <clears throat> the. Um, I'm trying to think. It, it looks like cream of wheat. Uh, uh, the the, mm-hmm. the southern folks eat a lot. Grits, 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 and uh, yeah. So I I thought it was cream of wheat, right? And uh, so I pour some milky sugar on it. And these guys are looking at me. This guy's crazy. And I tasted it and it had salt in it. And I said, holy moly, what is this? And they go, that isn't what you think it is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that certainly was. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, breakfast was my best meal. I, d- I understand that. That's like. I was just wondering if you packed on any weight because I, I just asked this because all the boot camp stories I've heard so far, some of the funnier ones, well, not funny. This guy came up from up in the hills in Virginia or somewhere uh-huh. and he'd never owned a pair of shoes. And he's like, these are my shoes. <laughs> you know? yeah. And they took him, they took him to the mess hall. He's like, what? We can eat all that food. Really? So when, <laughs> well, Lynn, I never you know, know where to experience. I will find, I will find a picture of me in boot camp and the size small. Uh, size small were too large for me because they only had small, medium, and large, right? The dungaree yeah. shirt hung off of me and, and, uh, the pants were too big. Uh, I had like a, I had like a <laughs> t- 25 inch waist, you know, and, and, uh, yeah. Whoa. I was a, I was, I was, I was a skinny kid, <laughs> you know. I thought oh, I was skinny at 32. Oh. <laughs> 31, 32 was the lowest I ever got. I'm about, I've packed on about a foot since then, you know. You get older, pack on a foot, you know, yeah. feel good, well, I, I, comfortable. I, <laughs> no, I, I gotta lose it. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I have that same foot. <laughs> so, and you know what? what? My, my wife, 
when, when my wife and I got married, I, I weighed about 120 pounds, and she weighed, she weighed 90. We, we shopped in the children's department at, at J.C. Penney's for my first four years in the Navy. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then you found, uh, <clears throat> what was the dynamic food? Did you discover ice cream sundaes or what? <laughs> uh, I, I, you know what? I, I, uh, from uh, uh, My first ship was a USS Jason. AR8 out of San Diego and uh, the same still went with the, with the food there. I, I didn't like a lot of the food, uh, you know, mashed potatoes, uh, peas and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of that doesn't just doesn't put weight on you. I didn't eat bread. So, you know, that I didn't have that problem with bread. I, I really don't eat bread to, to this day. And uh, so I oh. uh, uh, didn't really put in, a, put, a, put a lot of weight on. I, um, I, I told you that, uh, I had some restrictions on, uh, what I didn't, what I didn't realize is, uh, we made a Westpac. I came back, uh, from a Westpac and this, this guy put in for engine A school. I was working up on the boat deck, uh, uh, with the, uh, with the, with the, with the boats on the boat deck as a, as a engine man. Mm-hmm. The, the, uh, this, this guy puts in for it and I go, you know what? I'm really smarter than that guy is, you know, and they gave him A school. So I put in for A school. And it came back, the, the personnel office called me and said, you can't go to Intimate A school. You, you, we're sending you to electrician's mate school. And I go, mm-hmm. well, why would you want to send me to electrician's mate? You know, for the last 14 months, uh, you know, I, I've been an engine man. And they said, well, uh, you actually enlisted under a school guarantee. And I go, I did. <laughs> I said, well, where's my school? And they go, well, you had to, uh, at least uh, show uh, good faith that you're going to make uh, make it through your first uh, 18 months in the Navy, and then uh, and then we would send you to school, right? And I said, "Well, wow." I said, "Well, how come you how come you put me with the engine man instead of the electricians, right?" And they go, "Well, that they needed you as an electrician." I said, "So what? So I'm a I'm a fireman, right? Uh, e three right. E three." They literally have to send to the bureau so I could change my designator to go to engine A school. And here on my E3, they could just say, well, you know, he's an E3, send him to engine A school. No, they had to change it. Oh, you know why? Because that's part of my contract. Uh, the, uh, cause I had signed a contract saying that they were going to make me, uh, uh, I would go to, uh, electrician's mate, uh, A school, right? But, but I didn't know that because, you know, everything was a whirlwind in, in one day. Uh, it just so happened that once I went on recruiting duty, I found out that, uh, that, uh, 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 somebody that who is a minority, uh, with a 10th grade education and scores, uh, uh, real high on the exam can go in as uh, school eligible. And, uh, so th- they had me signed up to be a, uh, be a, an electrician. And of course, you know, when you're a young kid, mm-hmm. they say, what do you want to be? And I go, oh, well, I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I might have said, well, electrician sounds good. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, I don't, I don't remember that, you know. And so, uh, uh, January the 3rd, I, I end up in, uh, great, great lakes, great mistakes. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, as a, going to Engine A school and I was already, uh, you know, I had already made a Westpac. You know, I had my Hong Kong blues on with a, with a dragons on the sleeves and stuff like that. And, and, mm-hmm. uh, so I go up to the front desk there and, and, uh, the, uh, the first class that was, uh, taking us in, uh, uh, his name was Smith. And I said, yeah, to get his attention, I go, Hey, Smitty. And then he turned around and I had the senior chief rush the window. And then he says, you call him sir, right? And I go, hey, mm-hmm. hey, you know, senior, hey, senior, what's going on, man? You're, you're a little bit, uh, you know, uh, wound up. <laughs> and he said, you, you call me <laughs> sir, right? And I go, well, I don't think so, senior. I said, you're enlisted just like me. And, uh, so, uh, he said, roll your sleeves down. You know, my Hong Kong sleeves, right? Roll your sleeves down. And that's not a regulation, uh, 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 dress blues. Cause I had my Hong Kong, uh, uh, blues on and, 
and they, they were gabardine. And, and uh, he said, I better not ever see you wear those again. So, so there was a. What are now, now for those of us that weren't around when you had those, isn't that like you have your cuffs? They get the dragons like stitched underneath the uh, cuffs right. and the blues, or they even make the blues differently. They're like well, custom made well, yeah, blues. Yeah, it was a custom made blues. Uh, when we when we got to Hong Kong, you know, there was uh, a, a couple of things you could do, uh, real cheap, you know, and and one of them was uh, I made a a shark skin suit for for my wedding, and uh, and the uh, and then I had my dress blues made, and I don't I don't think I paid more than. 50 bucks for all that. And, uh, and, and, uh, wow. As I walked into that tailor shop, the, the tailor, he, he gets all excited. He goes, you know, did you see him? Did you see him? Did you, uh, did you see who was there? And I go, no, who are you talking about? He goes, uh, uh, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and Sammy Davis Jr. They just, they just walked out of the shop. I'm making, <laughs> and then he brings the paperwork over and shows it to me, right? See there, see there, they, and I go, hey, that's it. So, uh, so I had my my custom made suit. Uh, I said, well, I'm not going to pay the money they're paying. And say, oh no, no, you 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 uh, you a young sailor, you know, you don't pay. So so probably got the same suit for fifty, and they were paying probably fifteen hundred dollars at that time. And uh, yeah, Hong Kong tailors, uh, they're still pretty pricey. My friend outsources to him; he owns a suit store. So yeah, I totally I totally know about the Hong Kong tailor method. Well, you know what? But, uh, uh, I went to Hong good. Kong in uh, 1965, and Hong Kong was filthy. Uh, there was dead cows yeah. floating in the in the bay, and and uh, there was guys smoking opium on the open streets there. You know, uh, the the old guys sitting around uh, smoking dope. You know, and and it was uh, you know, I mean, it was it was uh, it was a slum. When I in the 60s, yeah, 60s huh? Look like a bad, a bad, a bad Bruce Lee movie. It, it, it did, <laughs> boy. You, you hit right on the okay. right on the head. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. Yeah. Uh, it was worse than going to Tijuana. Yeah. Wow. And uh, that's heavy. I, I see. I had no idea because when I went, it was in uh, the late in the eighties, and uh, we were in Hong Kong, and it was the British had brought it back up, and there was Seven Elevens on the corner, and a lot of American. Brands or English brands, oh, right? No, man. Um, when I was there, you, you better no? have shades, blades, hand grenades, and uh, a buddy next to you. Yeah, it yeah. was. It was uh, it, so stuff was going down. It was a little yeah, more dangerous yeah, back was, then. It was huh? rough. So what was the what was the adventure there? Just to just see what you're going to get into. Yeah, <laughs> you know what? Uh, uh, I, I happen to like history, so uh, you know, before uh, I was looking down at uh, the. Uh, uh, an open beer can, uh, you know, I kind of used to want to see the sights a little bit. And, uh, and, and as, yeah. as I was walking around, there was this drunk sailor who, uh, who was, uh, passed out by this phone booth. Right. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't even a booth. It was just a phone hanging up there on like on a telephone pole. And, uh, and so I looked down, I go, man, that's my, my, the brother that follows me. That's his best friend from my little hometown. <laughs> so, 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 I, so I, so I said, well, he's going to get rolled or stabbed or whatever, you know, and so I, so I pick him up and yeah, skinny as I was, you know, and he, he was a little, he was a little bit shorter than I was, you know, and so I'm, I'm just basically dragging him back to the uh, boat landing to, to, uh, he was on the, uh, on the, uh, USS, uh, Oh man, I, I should remember it, it was a, it was an aircraft carrier and you know, they used to, everybody used to moor out, right? And drop anchor. Yeah. Yeah. You had to take those ferry, right. you had to take right. the ferries so, out to your boat, so, right? But, but the, 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 he was on a big ship, uh, j just like I was on the Jason. So we actually had a Liberty launch, right? Our own Liberty launch. So the, uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, of course I have a ship's patch, USS Jason and, uh, and he has, uh, his ship, ship's patch, uh, uh, and, uh, and the, oh, it's the Bonhomme Richards. And, uh, so, so I'm helping him and, and none of his shipmates are helping me. Man. I'm dragging this guy, you know, and he's, he's really their shipmate, not my shipmate, but, but he's my little brother's friend, right? So I, I have to basically mm -hmm. carry him up the, the ladder once we landed. Uh, again, nobody helped me get him up the ship. 
And, and of course that's, that's walking like she had five or six stories, man. It was, it was, that ladder was, was enormous to go up there. And, uh, so I get there, uh, and I'm a saluting to, uh, to get on the ship. Mm-hmm. And there's this first class PN on the, on the, on the quarter deck, right? Yeah. It's my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> That's like relative day. Family meeting, it's exactly. a family gathering. And I go, I go, you know what? I say, here he's yours. I'm, I'm, I'm back out of here. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, so I caught their Liberty launch back to the, uh, you know, back to the landing and, and, uh, never did see him again. But that little tiny town of, uh, 8,000 people, uh, I ran into a lot of sailors from that little tiny town. That's the funny thing when you travel, you know. <clears throat> Were That's you right. now that Jason was like an AR, right? Yes. Huh? Was that like a tender, or what did the Jason do? What did what did yes, it's a repair ship? It's a auxiliary repair. Okay. So we we could basically do it everybody and anybody. And That's uh, interesting because so, you you go from this kind of ship to the super speedy ship, so you get to get in a diverse group of ships. You went through the, all the different types of navy, which. Usually, like I talked to my former ops boss, and he was like, uh, "Yeah, when you, once you pick what type of ship you're on, you kind of stay that line." You know what I mean? You can't right. if you're not on, using the certain technology for certain guided missile cruisers, like the the real spears, tip of the spear type ships. You end up in an auxiliary ship, or you end up being an aircraft type officer. It's it's pretty interesting how that works. But this is uh, like my ship. My ship was an auxiliary, but it carried bombs. So you guys uh-huh. fixed everybody, huh? Right, we fixed everybody. A uh, matter of fact, uh, I think it was the USS Turner Joy. Uh, mm-hmm. um, I guess you could look that up. Uh, the the Turner Joy uh, in 1965 was uh, off the uh, gun line there in Vietnam, and mm-hmm. they came back with a uh, their uh, their uh, after mount. One of the after mounts, uh, the it looked like a like the barrel was peeled back like a banana, mm-hmm. right? And of course, everybody is told uh, to stay away from the uh, from the uh, from the, the the the. I think it was port side of the ship. The way we were moored, uh, we were mm-hmm. we were actually pier side in uh, in Subic Bay. The uh, there was still a live round. What happened was uh, the uh, one of the shells didn't didn't fire. So when they when they shoot the other shell, it it it, it fires it right, and a couple of guys got killed. Um, the, uh, um, you know, uh, I think, you know, several got injured, but the, uh, I, I'm, I'm more than certain as a Turner Joy. Well, our, our, our gunner's mates, um, uh, uh, unbolted that thing and put it on a big crane. And I think they had help from, uh, from the sand crabs there, but, but, uh, our gunner's mates helped that because they ha- it has a live round in it. And they took that, mm-hmm. uh, that they took that mount out to sea and dumped it out past Grandy Island. Then they over in Subic, yeah, yeah. And then they put yeah. another another gun mount on it. And then the, the Turner Joy, they done all that like in a uh, couple couple of days, a week, whatever, you know. And uh, uh, the Turner Joy uh, uh, takes off again. So there wasn't like the new ships today where they they would park it to the pier and hold a big investigation, you know, on what happened. It was probably okay. This is well, what happened. Get underway for the gun line again. So you, so on the first ship, did you do any west packing? Is that what you were doing, or yeah. were you stationed out of? Uh, no, no. The ship, the, the ship actually left uh, in January for west pack, and we uh, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, and now we're we're in the Philippine Islands. But I was aboard the ship when when that okay. when that incident, and then. We, and while I was in there, on there, we also, a uh, typhoon came in on us and we got underway, uh, and, uh, uh, we hit, uh, uh, we hit seas already 60 foot high, you know, the, uh, the surge, uh, wow. man, we drove right into that surge and I go, Oh mama, we're going to die today. You know? And, uh, it was just amazing. The ship went up, 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 and then finally went down and, we were that we were in that storm for uh, I, I think like a week, and uh, wow, yeah. sixty foot monster yeah, wave, sixty That's foot crazy. seas, one hundred twenty five knot winds. I think gusting to one hundred fifty, and and uh, uh, we rode that thing out, rock and roll. Uh, yeah, the uh, 
the USS uh, Baja Richards uh, was out there with us, and waves were washing over her flight deck. There was two tin cans with us up there, and you couldn't see them. All you could just see is their masts going back and forth, right, up and down, back and forth. Could not see the ship. And uh, uh, maybe wow. just because the, the waves were such such a monster wave, you know, that that uh, couldn't see them. But they were they were they spent a lot of time underwater. 